Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. But this is a major passage that has been terribly misunderstood. And I really wanted to assert what I think is the, um, the theological balance that's here, so, so very significant theological balance, that I want to take this whole first page and I want to talk through it with you. Uh, this passage has been the center of controversy between Christian perfection, sometimes called entire sanctification, and mostly the Reformed churches, uh, but a large group of Protestantism which rejects the idea that anyone can rise to the plane of sinlessness in this life is basically the other side of this coin. Now, the tendency has been, there's two tendencies that are very, very dangerous in interpreting the Bible. The first one is, to expect what the Bible is going to say because you've always heard it and then read that into every text. No matter what the text says, you know what it means because you know what the Bible teaches. And, of course, that kind of biasness is a real problem. We must get those theological, personal experience glasses off and let the Bible speak to us. But the other real problem is that we proof text which says when we do understand what a passage says in its context, our tendency is to say, well, the Bible says it, that settles it. And that is not true. (laughs) If the Bible says it, we take it extremely seriously and then find out what else the Bible says on the same subject. Because we believe in the inspiration of the Bible as a whole, and there's great damage done when you pick one part out. Heresy has always come from the church, and heresy has always been the lifting of one aspect of truth up to the place where it becomes all truth. Now, what has happened here? I have talked to you about so many times in so many doctrines, and I want to talk about it again. They say you have to repeat something seven times before people catch it. This should be it. Denominations have locked down on certain texts. They follow the leaders, whether it's John Calvin or Zwingli or Minnow Simons or whoever you want to say, in the wake of great men of faith, interpretations get locked in. And -and so-and-so said it, that must make it true, is what we really have a tendency to do. We pick our favorite person. If they said it, that settles it. That's not true. It cannot be true. And so what we do, we sit on one Scripture text here or one Scripture text here, and then we curse one another across the pages of the inspired text. No understanding, no communication, just emotion. I'm right, you're wrong. And most of us learn our Bibles for the sole use of clubbing some poor brother and sister with it. Now, notice that we must take the text seriously itself before we compare it with any other scripture. But we must compare it at some point. So there's two dangers. Make sure you know what the text is saying and then try to relate it to what you know other texts say. Okay? Now, see, this this is important. And Baptists need to hear this because we're part of the what? Which group are we a part of? No one can be sinless group, aren't we? Yeah. This text clearly presents the high standards that all believers long for, total deliverance from sin's sway. This same ideal is presented in Romans 6. Now, did you hear what Bart read? 
That passage in Romans 6, man, the verb tenses are even stronger in Greek than the English about. We have died once and for all to sin. Sin no longer has its claws in us. We don't live in sin's power anymore. We have been delivered from sin's sway. Now, that's what it says. And you might want to see Matthew 5, 48 that says, where Jesus, at the end of that first section of the Sermon on the Mount, says unequivocally, and you can't water it down. He says, Be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, we've been guilty of watering these things down so we can swim in them. They choke us, so we water them down where they won't choke us. No, they're meant to choke you. They're meant to startle you. They're meant to bring you to a place to recognize that playing around with sin, even playing around in a little mud hole, is inappropriate for the child of God. What we've done with the doctrine that we're going to continue to sin is we're said... Well, if I'm going to continue to sin, I might as well enjoy this little part of it. No, the mud hole wasn't made for you. Now, like the hogs, we go back to the wallow, and like the dogs, we go back to the vomit. Gross as it is, it's the fact in the church, we like our little hidden petty sins, and we do not want to give them up. And we rationalize it, everybody's sinning. Everybody has these problems. Everybody's doing it. It's just my little sin problem. No! The child of God can't keep his own little private mud puddle to wallow in when he wants to. The goal is the fullness of the statue of Christ, which is sinless perfection. That's the goal. And that's what 1 John's going to present. And that's what Romans 6 is going to present. And that's what Matthew 5, 48 is going to present. Now, wait a minute. You say, rrr, 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 I can hear the roars coming. Either you haven't eaten or you're getting upset. <clears throat> Romans 7 follows Romans 6. What is Romans 7? It is Paul, the believer, struggling in his life with sin. Now, sin, 6 says you're delivered from it, and 7 is Paul's experience. Wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? What I want to do, I don't do. When I don't want to sin, I find myself sinning more. Romans 7 has to go with Romans 6 in context. Now, John 1, 8 through 2, 1 must, must, must go with John 3, 3 through 10. Must go together. But even though I'm going to put them together, I want to say again, I'm putting them together only because I'm trying to bring a balance. But I want to say to you, the goal of the Christian life is sinlessness. That's the ideal. That's the goal. That's the pull. That's the desire. Anything less than that desire is not of God. Being happy with anything less, being content with anything less is not God's will. Now, with that in mind, D is very important. This passage, however, must fit into the larger context of the entire book. And I've got three points. Number one, you can't interpret three without one, eight through two, one. I've said that to you. Look at the second one. To interpret this passage in such a manner as to defeat the overall purpose of 1 John which is assurance of salvation against the claims of the false teachers would be folly. Not ready, folly. Change that, would you? What is the purpose of 1 John? We've talked about it over and over again. There are false teachers in the church. John is trying to assure them they're true believers. He's using their lifestyle to prove it. And to say that if you sin, you're not a Christian, would destroy the whole purpose of the book of 1 John. Just think about it. What if I told you tonight, I'm trying to encourage you that you're a Christian. I'm trying to convince you that you're a Christian in the face of false teaching. And what if I said to you, now if you sin one time, you're not a Christian. Would that, would that encourage you? Would that give you assurance? Of course it wouldn't. And then three, this passage must be related to the false teacher's claim of sinlessness or sin's insignificance. 
They either are saying, I don't sin because they define sin a certain way. Or they're saying, sin is insignificant to me now that I am a child of God. Because I'm in the spirit now and what I do in the body to make any difference. These two passages are attempting to strike at both false heads of this doctrine. Both false heads. Um, possibly 1, 8 through 2, 2 deals with one extreme of the false teaching, while 3, 1 through 10 deals with the opposite extreme. Now, I really think that's what's happening. These false teachers were saying two different lies. John cuts off one head in chapter 1 and cuts off the other head in chapter 3. And we get so, we take the Bible so literally and jump on every little text that we just cause major problems for ourselves. Now, <clears throat> E, this is what I've said to you about a million times. The paradoxical relationship that exists between these two passages on sin in the Christian's life is, in my opinion, normative for all New Testament truth. It forms the same relationship, dialectical tension, if you please, between predestination and free will. Which one's true? Yes, they are. Does it make sense that they're both true? No. It's totally ignorant that they're both true, but they're both true. Uh, let me ask another one. Uh, is the Bible a human book or a divine book? Yes. How can it be both? I don't know. Is Jesus fully God or fully man? Yes, he is. How do you know? Because the Bible says so. How can that be? I don't know. Are we condemned because of original sin or because of volitional sin? Yes, we are. Which one? Both. How do you know? The Bible says both. How do they fit together? I don't know. Now, it seems to me what God has done. If it is true that truth is a road with two ditches or two extremes, what God has done... West Texans, you ought to buy this. Here's the road. Here's the ditches. God's put two barbed wire fence outside of both ditches. You may get in the ditch, but he don't want you to go any further, so there's the extreme. Now, there's a fence on the other side. He's going to keep you somewhere in the road. You may get off in one ditch or the other, but the, fit, the extremes are meant that in between them we move. Now, I think... That when we, what we have a tendency to do, all our theology, all of it, all of it, all of it, we've grown up in a, it's either A or B, it's either black or white, it's either R, it's either this one or that one. And so what we've done theologically as Baptists and every other group that I know of, to feel comfortable, we've had to negate one fence. We don't feel comfortable living in between We've got to say, I'm right, and so we've got to eliminate one barbed wire fence or the other barbed wire fence. Now, friends, if you eliminate either one of these barbed wire fences, I think you're out of the boundaries that God set for us. Okay? Both of them are important. What are, what are both of them? Be ye perfect is a barbed wire fence. But if you do sin, we have an advocate with the Father. It's a barbed wire fence. So what I mean is we need to strive for the ideal of the fullness of Christ but recognize that when we do sin and we will, there is ample forgiveness. But we don't waller in that mud hole. We get up, we confess, we get washed off and we're right back on the road heading toward the ideal again. Now some of us have been sitting in the mud hole a long time. It's time to get up out of the mud hole and get on with a little Christ-like living. God's not pleased with us in a mud hole, even though he knows we're going to do it. Let's get out. Get on. Are you going to fail? Certainly. But that will not stop us from going down that road as fast as we can possibly go. Now, F. I think this whole discussion is based on a misunderstanding of the theological difference. And I, this is a theological pattern that I'm putting on the Bible. This is a philosophical grid that I am setting down on the text of the Bible to give some meaning to what seems disoriented to me. Now, I want you to know, this isn't in the Bible any place. It's not even in the index. It's a middle grid that I put on the book. I think a misunderstanding is that we have to see there are three aspects to all practical theology. The first is, our position 
in Christ. We are holy in Christ. We are justified in Christ. We are complete in Christ. We are sinless in Christ. We can do all things in Christ, can't we? We are in Him positionally. Now, what we try to do once we recognize our positional acceptance and salvation is we try to move to the possession of the position. We try to bring the position into the daily life. We try to bring what we already are in Christ into reality in our daily lives. And I like the two terms, position and possession. We could say standing and experience, whatever you want to say. We are something full in Christ. Now we're trying to be something full in experience. And then one day, thanks be unto God, we're going to fully possess our position. And what will that be? Second coming, resurrection day, whatever you want to say. There will be a day when the struggling with who we really are is going to be ceased because we will be who we really are. So it's position, possession, consummation, because I couldn't think of the P to go with it. Okay, let's see. And I want to read the rest of this because I think I like the way I wrote it. Um, we are free from sin in Christ, yet we still struggle with it, parenthesis, and should struggle more with it. This book as a whole teaches the priority of admitting our sin and striving towards sinlessness all the time, experientially sinning less. And let me say that again. If you've been a Christian 40 years, you ought to be closer to perfection than a baby Christian. If you've walked with Jesus five years, there ought to be less sin in your life the day you begin. The mud hole ought to be getting smaller. Crude, rude, but true. I get very emotional about that because I think we've just made ourselves a little excuse. Well, I'm going to sin anyway, so I might as well enjoy it. Yuck, 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 yuck. God calls us to the holiness to which He's already given us. The pull is not to the mud hole once we're a Christian. The pull is to maturity. Now, let's go to chapter 3 because I'm going to get in the horse. <clears throat> By the way, here are the two books I mentioned to you down there under, I think I gave you some books, didn't I? Some of you have never read Wesleyan Theology. Now, I want to tell you, I love John Wesley. I don't agree with him always. But friends, if you put me on an island, I'll take John Wesley over Calvin. Give me John Wesley's love, I will tell you. Most of you have never read anybody other than a Baptist theologian. This will bless your heart. Christian Theology, it's three-volume set by H. Arton Wiley. This is volume two, page 440 and following. It's his discussion of perfection. And I want to tell you, to hear it from them, it sounds plum good. You've never heard it from them. You've only heard folks blast it. You all read this. Wesleyans are more Arminians. And I'll just take as many of them as I can get. People always ask me, are you an Arminian or a Calvinist? You bet I am. This is by B.B. Warfield. You don't get no more Calvinistic than this unless, well, you just can't. B.B. Warfield. This is a book on perfectionism where he talks about what he thinks the folly of this doctrine. Now, there are two books from two uh, bright lights in the field. And if this interests you, you ought to check them out. Chapter 3. Now, really, I think a new paragraph should begin in verse 28. So if I was going to be logical, I'd start with 28 and go through 310 tonight. But I've already dealt with 328 and 29. But I want to pick up again. In 329, notice it says, is born of him. Now, I started marking in my Bible in colors. And the reason I do that is because it's helpful to me to keep certain theologies together. You see all, some of you can't, you see all the yellow ones? The doctrine of the rebirth 
is over and over here. It's mentioned in 229, 31, 32, 39, uh, twice in 39, and in 310. Now listen to me. John uses born again where Paul uses adoption. Nothing, nothing sacred about the term born again. That, that, that's just one metaphor among many. So John uses born again. Paul uses adopted. Okay? Now, see what wonderful love. This word see is an aorist imperative. Look once and for all at what wonderful. This, this word what wonderful literally means in what foreign country. That doesn't sound right, does it? But it came to be used as an idiomatic phrase for wonder, awe, surprise. See once and for all what foreign love. Why don't I say foreign love? It's unearthly. It's unnatural. It's supernatural. It's God's love. It doesn't fit in our world. See what wonderful love, agape love. I think agape, which means God's sacrificial love with no demand for response, is parallel to the Old Testament love, hesed, which means God's no-strings-attached covenant love. Aren't you glad God loves you the way you are? Now, He's not finished with you, but wherever you are, that's where He starts walking with you. That's what I'm trying to say. It's not that He accepts your sinfulness, but wherever He finds you on the road... He'll walk right beside you from then on, okay? No strings attached. He'll take you where you are, and he'll take you where he wants you to be loved, okay? The Father has bestowed, perfect tense, once and for all bestowed on us in letting us be called, aorist passive. Once and for all, by an outside agent, we are called. That is an honorific word. Think. Think with me. Tonight, on your forehead, can you, those of you who have a lot of hair, pull it back. Some of you can just see it without it. Right across your forehead, if we're going to speak in symbolic eschatological terms, is written, Child of God. Now, there's going to be another name written there one day, isn't it? Child of the Beast. But friends, I want you to know God's got a little machine. It's not really a fluorescent tube. It's just similar and when you go up, he'll go, and if he sees that, you can get in. We're not going to be the children of God. We are the children of God. It's no probation. We're the children of God because of our relationship with Jesus Christ, and hopefully we're going to act more and more like the children of God, but we are the children of God. Now, have you ever thought, just think with me, that you, sinful turkey you, was chosen by God to be part of His family forever and ever and ever. Ever, eternity without end, God wanted you to be near Him. He didn't choose you when you loved Him. He chose you when you were running from Him. Whew. Now, God's children, wouldn't you say that's another emphasis like being born again? Same, same kind of metaphor? And that we are. Does someone have King James here? You'll notice that and that we are is not in your text, is it? Of 3.1. King James is based on the Byzantine family of manuscripts. They were a late family. How it happened, I don't know. But that late family left out this whole text. Now, usually King James adds things, but here it left it out. This little phrase, and such we are, present tense, is in the papyri. In Aleph, in A, in B, in C, those are the five biggies have it every place. So it should be there. And that we are. This is why the world does not know what we are. Now, friends, what is the world? Well, go back to chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, because you wrote it in your Bible, because I asked you to, remember? Definition of the world. Someone read back to me that definition. The world is... Good. Human society organized and functioning apart from God. It doesn't matter what society, capitalism, communism, 
dictatorship. What is not what we're talking about. It's just human organization in whatever form without God at the center. Okay? Now, the world does not know us. Why? Well, friends, the world didn't know him either. You ought to see John 15, 18 and 19, John 17, 14 and 15. Jesus says, don't be surprised when the world hates you. The world hated me. If the world hated me, it's sure going to hate you if you're mine. Now, think about that. I'm going to play Vance Havner for a minute. Another sign that you are a Christian is when the world steps on your nose. The fact that you've been had your nose stepped on by the world is a beautiful sign that you're a believer. If they stepped on it because you're a Christian. Now, some of you got stepped on other reasons. But. Persecution is a sign that you're a child. This is another evidence you're genuine. It's when the world does not know you. Now, notice where it mentions here then. We are because it has never come to know Him. Verse 2, Dearly beloved, now we are God's children. There's an emphasis on rebirth again. But what we are going to be has not yet been unveiled. You mean John, who in chapter 2, verse 27 says, boldly, uh, the anointing of the Spirit which you've received still remains in your heart, so you have no one to, tell you, to teach you anything because you know it everything. Look at that. He teaches you about everything. You mean John, who says he knew about everything, doesn't know how it's going to be? Yeah, because 227 is not exhaustive knowledge. It's salvation knowledge. John is saying, I am an agnostic about how it's going to be one day. I'm so glad John didn't know, because Jesus didn't know. Now, what John's saying is, I don't know what it's going to be like. Now, you know, I like 1 Corinthians 2, 9, where Paul says, I has not seen, ear has not heard, nor entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. And that's as close as Paul could get to describe heaven. He was up there in the third heaven. He came back and said, you just got to fly it. Now, notice where it says, uh, has not yet been unveiled. Okay, he just didn't know. We know that if it is unveiled, he is unveiled, that's what he's talking about, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. Now, what does that mean? Something's going to happen to us. You know, it talks about the moment of twinkling of an hour is going to be changed. What's going to happen? When the eastern sky opens up, the Lord Jesus comes back in the clouds of heaven with all the angels and all our dead loved ones and friends from time immemorial who trusted him. When we see him, bang, that's when the change is going to come. Moment we turn our eyes toward him, whatever he's like is going to come right here. We don't know what he's going to exactly going to be like, but whatever he's like, won't we see him? We're changed into his likeness. There's a several scripture texts for that. Let me give you a few. You'll love these. Look them up later. Second Corinthians three eighteen, Philippians three twenty one, Colossians three four. Don't know what he's going to be when we see him. We'll be like him. Now, friends, the alternative to being like him is what? <laughs> being damned. See, there's not much of a middle ground. You're either going to be like him or you're going to be separated from him. You're either going to hold your hand out and say, Oh, Lord! Or you're going to run the rocks and the trees and the hills to fall on you and try to get away from him. That's all. It's there's only two ways. Now, notice where it says here, And we shall be like him. You will see First uh, Corinthians 13, 12, where it says, Now I know in part, but one day I'll know as I have been known. Now that's the same kind of thing coming from Paul instead of John. And everyone, now I want to show you something. There is a ton of everyone's through here. There's an everyone in 229. There's an everyone in 33. There's an everyone in 34. There's two everyone's in 36. There's an everyone in 39. And there's an everyone in 310. Why so many everyone's? John's saying, his, the way he's always said it, friends, there are no exceptions to this. You're either of the God or you're of the devil. You're either black or you're white. You're either living right or you're living wrong. You're either going to be like him or you're going to be like the evil one. There's, that's all there is. And everyone is in those two. That's why, that's why there's so many of them through here. And everyone who puts his hope in him. Now, the word hope here speaks of resurrection day, the second coming tries to make himself pure as he is. Now listen, 
This is a present tense. And the word himself is included in the text. So what we have here is continues to purify himself. Now, is, is, that, is that something that sounds awkward? Well, if you got these... Does God do everything for us or does man participate in God's work? Yes. As receiving Jesus Christ in John 1, 12 is part of God's plan for salvation... So purifying ourselves is part of God's plan in sanctification. We have a part in justification. We have a part in sanctification. We must yield ourselves to the cleansing of God. We must be active in purifying ourselves. I want to give you a ton of scriptures that say that. Let me give you just a ton of them. I think you have most of them uh, with you. Let's see. James 4, 8, 1 Peter 1, 22, 2 Corinthians 7, 1 are all just like that. Now, this word uh, purify is a very important word. It's used in the Septuagint of the high priest taking a bath and, and offering that sin sacrifice before he walks into the Holy of Holies. Now, I'm going to put it crude again, would you? We're on a road toward Christ-like maturity. Get yourself out of mud holes. <laughs> I don't care how much you enjoy them. I don't care how everybody's doing them. I don't care how you can rationalize them. Get out of mud holes and get back on the road. Now, there's no doubt in your mind where the mud holes are. You know what you've been wallowing in. Get out of that thing. Turn it over to God. Get back on the path of the ideal. Now, everyone who commits... Sin commits lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Now, in English translation, when I read the lawlessness, I think immediately that John's saying breaking a rule. Is that what you... That, some of you have to sin is against the law. When I see that word, it's not the normal word for law. It's a word for anarchy. And so when I normally see it, I say, oh, that means I've broken some boundary. I've broken some rule. No. No, no, no. This is as close as we can get, there are several other ones like it, to a definition of sin. What really is sin? Is sin breaking a rule? No. The breaking of the rule is the outworking of the attitude of sin that's in our heart. Sin is defined as rebellion against God. No one ever stumbled into a mud hole. We jumped in hollering hooray. Sin is open-eyed rebellion against God doing our own thing because it feels good and we want to do it. Now, that's what lawlessness means. Open-eyed, known rebellion. Nobody's going to say, God, I was trapped by sin. It jumped on me. You didn't know what it was. You knew it and you held out your hand and said, come on. That's the truth. Now, some other places where sin is... Uh, Somewhat defined, I think I put in your outline. I didn't write it in my Bible. Yeah, I did. Romans fourteen twenty three, James four seventeen, First John five seventeen, or other aspects of sin. Isn't it funny? The same word lawlessness is used in Second Thessalonians two, verses three and seven for the Antichrist that we talked about in the last the last section of our teaching. The Antichrist knows the truth, and he's open eyed. Rebelling against God. Now, you know that he, that he appeared to take away our sins. That's a beautiful thing. This word take away means to lift up and bear away. Now, there are two possible backgrounds to this. One of them is Leviticus 16, the scapegoat, that one of them was killed and one of them bore the sin symbolically out of the camp. But the other one is Isaiah 53 where it says he bore our sins on the cross. And there are many passages that are in your notes. So either it's the scapegoat taking sin out of the camp, or it's Jesus carrying the sin load of the world on his shoulders. Whichever it is, aren't you glad that he did it? Took away our sins. That's what, uh, remember when John the Baptist first saw him and what he said, John 1, 29? Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Bears it away. Now, and the last little part of this thing, and there is no sin in him. 
It's present tense. He never sinned. He, he, no, he just hadn't sinned. Then, now, whatever. The sinlessness of Jesus is absolutely crucial if we're going to teach the vicarious substitutionary atonement. If he sinned, he had to die for his own sin. If he didn't sin, then he can take my place. Now, the sinlessness of Jesus is mentioned so often in the Scriptures. 2 Corinthians 5.21, Hebrews 4.15, Hebrews 7.26, 1 Peter 1.19, 1 Peter 2.22. He had no sin. Now, verse 6. No one, that word everyone, who continues to live in union with him practices sin. No one who practices sin has ever seen him or known him. Practices sin, both of those are present tense. Now listen to me. Turn back over quickly to chapter 2, verse 1. Chapter 2, verse 1. John says this, after saying, if you say we have no sin, we're lying, and you've got to confess your sin. After that he says, My little children, I'm writing you that you may not, look at your text, sin. But if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. Both of those terms for sin are in the aorist tense. An aorist tense speaks of completed action. So what John is saying, you may sin now and then, Christian, and if you sin now and then, there is an advocate for now and then sins after you're a believer. But now in chapter 3 he's saying, if your life is characterized by living in the mud holes, you never met him. You never met him in the past. You don't meet him in the present. You've never seen him? Perfect. Two perfects. You've never met him? No, never met him, and the state remains the same. John is not playing games. He's using two very important verb tenses. One speaks of isolated acts of sin, and one speaks of a life characterized by sin. Now, I'll make a dogmatic statement, and I think it's biblical, because I think I'm trying to say what John's going to say in another way. If you are totally dominated by rebellion... You have not met the master. You say, oh, but there's backslider. I agree with you that 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 12 says that some are going to make it in the midst of the mud holes. But you want to trust in that? John's saying the way you know you're a Christian is because you walk like he walked. Now, you may sin now and then, but if your life is characterized, dominated habitually by sin, there is a major problem in your relationship with Christ. Now, you see, most of us have taken sin so lightly, we've got major mud hole problems in our lives. And we're just saying, all Christians have cake mud on them. It's all right. It's just normal. It is abnormal. Mud holes are abnormal for children of God. They may happen, but they're abnormal. Now, notice where he continues in, verse 7. Dear children, avoid letting anyone lead you astray. Present imperative. Look back at 2.26. I write with reference to those who are trying to lead you astray. The word seduce. There are some people. I want you to know that tonight. There are some people dressed in sheep's clothing carrying a large King James that wants to lead you into the mud holes. And they are slick and they are logical. And you know how you tell them? They don't emphasize Jesus and they say, come with me to the mud hole. Now, friend, if someone doesn't emphasize Jesus and said, come with the mud hole, you ought to know who they are. By their fruits ye shall know them. It's not hard. If they say, come with me, say, where? If it's not Jesus, it's a mud hole. And they're all around us. In Jesus' name, they're all around us. Whoever practices doing right is right, present tense, just as he is right. Whoever practices sin belongs to the devil because the devil has practiced sin, both presents, from the beginning. It's as simple as that. How many of you, when you have a new grandbaby, say, Oh, he has my eyes, and he has my nose, and he has my hairline? 
That poor little wrinkly looking rat, you find every characteristic of your family in that little red thing, don't you? Sure you do. He's got Aunt Martha's hair. and uh, Friends, I want to tell you what, if we're a child of God, we ought to have the, the characteristics of God. Now, if we're not his child, we're going to have the family characteristics of the evil ones. There's only two options. Only two families here. God's family and the devil's family. And you're in one of them. And you look like the family which you're in. The devil sinned from the beginning. You'll see John 8, 44. And I think from the beginning here, I think. Now, it's, this may be Garden of Eden or whatever, but I think this is the angelic conflict. You see, man wasn't the first to sin. The angels fell before man and the world was created. So I think just talking about the pre-creation fall of the angels, if you please. And this is why the Son of God has appeared to undo the works of the devil. Now, the word undo means to unbind the chain of Christians. Now, listen to me. Back in, uh, down the see, in verse 5, this is a parallel to verse 5. When it says that he came to take away our sins, this is a parallel phrase. He came to undo the works of the devil. Now, he's not talking about Satan blinding the eyes of lost people like 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. He's talking about sin in the Christian life. Now, there's two purposes of redemption. Listen to me now. Please listen to me. There are two major purposes of redemption. To save you, to redeem you, to make you, put you from the family of the evil one into God's family. That is a purpose of redemption. But the second major purpose of the cross and redemption is to clean you up and let you start looking like Him. This is not talking about unbelievers. This is talking about getting the meat hooks of sin out of the lives of believers. He has come to set us free, to break the chains of the evil one in the Christian's lives. We're not talking about lost folks here. We're talking about saved folks. He came to unwork, undo the works of the devil. And that has to refer to... We're talking about sin all the way through here. Okay. Here's verse 9. This is when it's killed everybody. Just read it in your translation. It's just a killer stomper. Just read it. You believe the Bible's inspired, don't you? <laughs> read that thing and mourn. Who has King James? Phil, do you have yours? Would you read yours real loud for me? Woo! 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 Anybody want to stand up? Anybody here hadn't been in the mud hole the last 30 days? Now that is, a, that is some statement. Just think what he's saying. Anyone who is born of God can not sin because God's seed is in him and he can not sin. Now, can you imagine why this has broken the back of many a person right here? Now this is where most perfectionists put their stool. Now, how do they do it? Well, they redefine sin. Now, you, you know and I know that none of us can live above known sin. So if you redefine sin, it's possible that you can define it in such a way that you don't do it, isn't it? That's exactly what most schools of sinless perfection do, is redefine sin in such a way they can live with it. Now, John Wesley did say this was, this was possible in the Christian life, but John Wesley never claimed to have arrived there. Now, some of his followers, followers claimed to arrive there, but John Wesley said, I think this is a potential. I think in Christ I can do this, but I have never reached there myself. Well, that's where I am. John, let me come along with you, friend. I think that is an ideal that I've never reached, but I still want to be on the way. God bless John Wesley. Now, these are present tense verbs. This being born of God, though, is a perfect passage, just like 2.29. We're born of God in the past. We remain the children of God by an outside agent. Makes a practice of sinning. Present tense. No one habitually sins who is born of God. Why? Because, now my translation, look at yours. Please, please look. I'm in verse 9. Do you have the God-given life principle? Or do you have his seed? What do you have? Now, the Greek word here is the word sperma. That's right. So 
So we're talking about a human seed, possibly. Because this is used in the Old Testament all the time for human male sperm. All the time. And so that's one of the theories. It's referring to... Uh, it's, a, it's similar to the phrase, born of God. Okay? It's just another way of saying God's children. And I think that's possible. Augustine Luther said, it's God's Word that abides in us and we can't sin. And they got a couple of passages. Luke 8, 11, James 1, 18, 1 Peter 1, 23, John 5, 38. Well, John Calvin said it refers to the Holy Spirit. John 3, 6, and 8 in the Gospel. Some say it refers to the divine nature or the new self. Okay, 2 Peter 1, 4, Ephesians 4, 24. Some think it's synonymous with the being born of God. That's what I said about sperma. That's Luke 1, 55, John 8, 33 and 37. And some say it was used by the Gnostics as a catch term, and John just picked it up and used it against them. And that is true. It was used by them. Now, verse 10 is a summary of verse 3 through 9.